This is Pulse 95. Pulse 95. It's the Morning Majulus. It's the Morning Majulus. Good morning, uh, Sharjah and the United Arab Emirates. Welcome on to the Morning Majlis. And now, one good thing is uh, for this week, uh, the trio is complete and we are here as one full team. Yes, we are. Once again. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the, the flu season is back. The COVID oh, is, is flexing its muscles. It is. Yeah. If you you think you have COVID, but it doesn't. You don't have to have COVID. You can just have the normal <laughs> flu. It's it's normal, guys. Yeah, and it's normal. Yeah. But but I yeah. think it's very important to be being responsible and getting Absolutely. those tests done. Absolutely. Have to always distinguish whether it's uh, COVID, God forbid, or it's just the yeah. normal flu. So you gotta get tested all the time. True. Get those precautions in. But today. Speaking of the big show that we've got to planned, uh, it's going to be another busy day, but it's been a busy day uh, for the ruler's office as well. Absolutely. So many inaugurations that has happening, that's been happening actually um, lately. His Highness Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasimi, Supreme Council member and ruler of Sharjah. We know that he, um, His Highness inaugurated the heritage area in Khorfakan on Sunday morning. And we know that the Khorfakan heritage area is just considered to be one of the one of the Emirates' most important projects because it will be transforming Sharjah into a more uh, touristic and cultural destination to attract tourists and other visitors and de- definitely will offer um, the the uh, the tours of the Emirates' ancient history and heritage. And we also know that a couple of days ago, She's Garden, um, we you guys talked about that mm-hmm. uh, as well. Um, it was also inaugurated by His Highness and um, beautiful, beautiful uh, mountain um, escape, let's say. Um, with with artificial waterfall that f- flows into the lake surrounded by stone paths and formations of stone sessions amazing one um, on Thursday his highness also inaugurated the Kalba road which um, you know, comprises of the uh, Wadi al Hilu road as well but yesterday there was yet another important inauguration this time is for the love of literacy and heritage so stay tuned to find out more about that yeah, we've got a lot to talk about this morning. Seems every day on the Morning Majlis, uh, there are announcements about new developments around the UAE, inaugurating new destinations, so that's going to be pretty fun to talk about. Uh, we're going to delve into what is happening with the U.S. election so far. Uh, today's a pretty key date uh, where uh, voting in some key states is uh, set to begin ahead of the November 3rd election day. And we're going to talk about the power of social media within the election uh, number of users on TikTok uh, have been accused of not disclosing uh, financial information, the fact that they've been paid to put together some anti-Trump content on the platform, uh, and that's been there's been a crackdown on the platform for that as well. So we're going to talk about the ways uh, social media platforms are used to influence the presidential election. And uh, speaking of elections, we've got a pretty big update from Bolivia as well. A major shakeup uh, and the socialists making a major comeback there as well. So we'll talk about the background uh, circumstances that led up to this. But Sharjah has a big event to look forward to on November, and that's the Sharjah International Book Fair. The press conference announcing the details was yesterday. We attended it. And uh, today morning, we're going to tell you all about what to expect on this uh, incredible and unique event. Certainly, very uh, much look to look forward to for the event, and uh, we'll just keep you posted uh, throughout the show. So stay tuned to Pulse 95. We'll be right back after a short interval, and we'll keep you moving throughout the day. This is the Morning Minds List only on Pulse 95. Pulse 95. 95. Between local lines, notes from the Emirate. Yes, notes from Sharjah, indeed. His Highness Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasimi, Supreme Council member and ruler of Sharjah, has had a very, very busy week with many inaugurations, exciting ones here, and they're all contributing to the touristic uh, aspects of of Sharjah. From inaugurating the Kalba Road uh, back on Thursday to She's Garden. The amazing, the amazing cheese garden. I'm so looking forward to going and visiting that park. To the heritage area in Khorfakan or the heritage or the Khorfakan Heritage Area project that was also inaugurated Sunday morning. But His Highness did not stop there. Yesterday, another exciting inauguration happened and took place also in Khorfakan, and that happens to be Khorfakan Literary Council. And the council is the most recent uh, cultural location in support of the cultural and literacy or literary movement in Khorfakan City. And also it's a continuation 
of the cultural vision of His Highness the ruler of Sharjah. As the council will organize many events, workshops, uh, cultural seminars, poetry evenings and also forums that will bring together writers and cultural leaders in that council. Yeah, and the building is designed in a local style. It's located on two floors with an area of 950 square meters. It includes several facilities. It's got a theater that accommodates 112 spectators, a poet's council for 52 people, and a library that includes addresses on various topics in addition to a number of administrative offices. His Highness, the ruler of Sharjah, also went to the heritage area in Khorfakan, where His Highness opened the Poetry House toured on the halls of the Heritage Building, listened to the history of that building, which was converted to a poetry house, its goals and missions in attracting poets, intellectuals and writers, and about the center's activities in organizing seminars, evenings and poetic dialogues. His Highness also inaugurated the Popular Poetry Center. He inspected the center's facilities and departments and the cultural activities that the center would offer to enhance the cultural and literary aspects of Khorfakan. And uh, there's a long history behind these buildings. The history of the Poetry House and the popular Poetry Center goes back to the 30s of the last century. The buildings were restored, refurbished using materials that correspond to the building's character. So the identity of these buildings was not lost. Uh, so is the identity of Khorfakan and the buildings it always had, uh, maintaining that culture, that heritage, uh, while uh, creating modern activities for people here to enjoy, whether visitors or residents alike. Yeah, it's the Khorfakan's actually got a bit of an aesthetic uh, um, makeover as well when it comes down to uh, the Khorfakan Beach and Cornish area. So a number of restaurants and eateries have opened up, and it's a very quirky a little aspect and corner for the Khorfakan uh, Beach. There is the main public beach where the public is, uh, or the general public are aware of, and then further down, uh, a similar concept to Al Majaz waterfront is what we have, and a similar concept to Al Qasba Canal. We have uh, the the uh, Khorfakan Canal as well. It looks amazing at night, just uh, at the end of the heritage area, something that you could go for a perfect picture opportunity and uh, just a little bit of a getaway. And amazing, amazing thing about Khorfakan is we're so used to the hustle and bustle of the yeah. life in Sharjah that when you step out towards the mountainous region, uh, it is so calming. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a little bit of a... a, 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 a a unique escape. Yeah, and speaking of that, I'm so excited uh, to go and visit Al Shis Garden in Wadi Shis in Khorfa Khan. It's going to be, I mean, this this location or this park actually was um, fully packed a day after the inauguration of His Highness. And uh, we can see that with the video and the, mm. the coverage on uh, Sharjah TV. Um, but yeah, the park is located on an area um, of of, of 11,362 square meters. It receives its vid- visitors with a 25 meter high artificial waterfall mm-hmm. that flows into the lake surrounded by stone paths and formations of stone sessions. Um, it contains a mountain walkway from three uh, different mountain terraces connected by stone stairs. It will lead to the main uh, viewing platform at a height of 30 meters from the main uh, garden level. Now, it will include paths of 506 meters surrounded by palm trees, a group of local plants, a play area for the kids, and also 32 shaded sessions for families. And what I'm really excited about is the outdoor theater. Oh, yeah. They have an outdoor theater. It's been established to fit 70 people. And a barbecue area as well has been prepared and equipped with high standards of safety and environmental preservation. So we know where to go this weekend. This weekend, because... When it comes to a long weekend, people, there's going to be packed. Yeah. There won't be space to even uh, walk around or, and I'm pretty sure there'll be some social distancing measures yeah. that are being enforced as well. So you might end up being disappointed. So the best thing is to uh, go as soon as possible, really, yeah. um, and uh, take that chance uh, in uh, making sure that you celebrate uh, your weekends and uh, enjoy the first proper weekend of the, the season as they call it, the good season of being outdoors. So lots to look forward to, lots to explore now in Khorfa Khan and uh, in the eastern region of the country in general. Uh, let us know on the text lines 4215 if you've got a particular spot that is your go-to spot uh, 
and uh, we will let our listeners know and hopefully they won't invade it next time you want to go but stay with us on the morning match list there's lots to uh, be entertained uh, with and uh, we'll be right back continuing the discussions right here on the morning match list join the conversation with the morning match list pulse 95 yeah join the conversation with the morning match list something that we are lo- uh, looking forward to at the moment is the Sharjah International Book Fair. Ahmad Awood was part of the press conference yesterday and uh, lots of big announcements uh, took place. Yeah, a lot of big announcements took place. Uh, it is set to be the most unique edition of the Sharjah International Book Fair. And that's because of the unique circumstances we're going through with a pandemic. And for months, uh, they had been facing questions as to whether or not this event would take place anyway. But it did. And uh, there's so much uh, that is uh, set to happen as far as uh, the program is concerned. His Excellency Ahmed bin Raqad Al Amri, Chairman of the Sharjah Book Authority, uh, spoke at the press conference about what visitors uh, and participants should expect. Uh, so here are the details. Uh, starting things off, uh, Sharjah International Book Fair will take place from November 4 to 14th. Yeah. And uh, they are taking strict measures to keep the venue as safe as possible. So one thing they've done this year is they've expanded the parameters of the venue. Uh, so it's going to be a larger space overall than last year. And also the number of visitors to the book fair has been capped at 5,000 people every three hours, according to the organizers. Uh, number of entryways with thermal gates. Uh, people will be scanned as well uh, uh, and uh, places will be regularly sanitized. And uh, they've also announced uh, that uh, as far as the cultural activities are concerned, this means all the sessions, the workshops, the talks by famous authors, those are going to be taking place online on the Sharjah Reads platform. Uh, and uh, uh, they have to register uh, and go on the website uh, sharjahreads.ae in order to gain more information. So that's just a bit of a glimpse, but there's so much happening and they've gotten into much more detail as to what to expect. Yes, yeah, so much to expect. A total of 1,024 publishers from 73 different countries will participate in this year's edition of the Sharjah International Book Fair. Um, they will put up more than 80,000 titles at the Sharjah Expo Center across an area spanning over 10,000 square meters. Now, also uh, this year, uh, the book fair uh, will be bringing together 60 intellectuals, artists, and cultural figures from 19 different countries. And for the first time in the event's history, the SBA has tied up uh, with um, embassies of various countries in the UAE to also design eight intellectual discussions. And these will be led by Emirati writers and their counterparts from Spain, Germany, France, Italy, and also Russia. As for the publishers for the conference, the 10th edition of the SIBF Publishers Conference will welcome 317 publishers and 33 speakers from across the world. They will discuss key uh, uh, issues and challenges facing the global publishing industry in 11 uh, in-person and virtual sessions uh, also. But that's another that's another event that will be taking place from the f- uh, 1st of November till the 3rd in uh, also Expo Center. But going back to the uh, Sharjah International uh, uh, Book Fair, mm. so much is happening again. So much is happening again and a lot of uh, e- e- addresses will be taking place. There will be a lot yeah. of e-lectures and there is going to be a number of uh, well-known authors that will be uh, joining us uh, uh, at the, also joining us here um, in the in the United Arab Emirates, Neil uh, Pasreka, a Canadian author and television host as well. Uh, we've got Ian Rankin who's going to be joining us, best-selling writer from the United Kingdom. Prince EA, that's the big one. And Dr. Shashi Tharoor makes a a return again and he's he's a regular frequent visitor of the Sharjah International Book Fair and a very popular figure amongst the Indian community so so much to look forward to with the Sharjah International Book Fair and we're very very excited um, and uh, in line with all this uh, we'll we'll keep you uh, posted because we'll continue the uh, the hype uh, build up for it uh, for the time being uh, but I asked you a very important question uh, on the morning majlis and uh, that was what was the biggest selling single of the year 2019 guys have been saying um, 
Uh, is it Old Town Road for you guys? Uh, I changed my mind. It's probably Post Malone. Post like, Malone. Wow, remember? You know, you know that song? It was like a big. It was a big hit. That was a big hit. Yeah. yeah. Post Malone came up with bangers, but I remember when Old Town Road came out, it was ubiquitous. Everywhere you yeah. went, sports teams were playing it. People were blasting it left and right. People were making parody songs. That's my vote, oh. for sure. What is it, AK? Are you gonna uh, reveal it now? Uh, we will reveal it now, and uh, let's reveal it. Let's reveal it. The and biggest single of 2019. Okay. Was. Let's play this. Drums. Let's, I have drums or something. Okay. I'll play. It'll play uh, this. Let's see if we can play, play the song itself. If we can. Whoa! It's an uh, advert. Yes. <laughs> uh, I will. I will play this song. There we go. You know this? This was Sharjah was embraced by his visitors. I know. Yeah. Uh, this was the biggest selling single. Really? It was? Yep, it was. There we go. Celebrating all things Sharjah, celebrating all things music. And uh, the biggest selling single of the year 2019 was indeed Someone You Loved by Lewis Capaldi. And that is up next on Pulse. 95. Join the conversation with the Morning Majlis, Pulse 95. Join the conversation, text us at 4215, and uh, we're covering the state of the U.S. presidential elections. Election day is on November 3rd. It's coming up, and uh, the final presidential debate is set to take place uh, on Thursday. Yeah. It's going to be between uh, U.S. President Donald Trump and Democratic challenger Joe Biden. And uh, things have been getting heated ahead of the debate. The two have been feuding over debate topics. And uh, they've also, the commission of presidential debates has also unleashed new rules here. So, so much for us to discuss this segment. But let's start with the latest update. The fact that the commission of presidential debates, following what was a raucous, loud, and full of interruptions debate last time around, yeah. where each candidate barely got a word and even the moderator couldn't speak. And it was described by observers and analysts as the chaotic affair, quite possibly one of the worst presidential debates, some <laughs> opined. Uh, they've got new rules this time around. And under these rules, President Trump and Democratic nominee Joe Biden will each have two minutes of uninterrupted time to speak at the beginning of every 15-minute segment of the debate. Quote, the only candidate whose microphone will be open during these two-minute periods is the candidate who has the floor under the rules, according to the commission. After that, there will be some time for discussion, with both candidates' microphones being open. The commission says both campaigns have agreed to this uninterrupted rule, and it's an effort to allow both candidates to have equal time to answer questions and also get to finally speak. Yeah, and on the other hand, they're also feuding over plans for their final uh, TV uh, debate. Um, the Republican president's campaign accused organizers of this week's showdown of helping the Democrat by leaving out foreign policy as a topic. So they are feuding over the topics massively. The Biden camp shot back that Trump was trying to avoid questions about his response to the coronavirus pandemic. Biden has a commanding lead nas uh, nationally in opinion polls with two weeks to go until the election. But he has a smaller lead uh, in the handful of key U.S. states that will ultimately decide the outcome. Yeah, look at those polls. Um, tr Joe Biden's clearly leading, but uh, the polls are just polls. They're, yeah. they're, they're the ones that are just going to be there uh, on online and uh, just to bring uh, uh, some form of a sentiment towards it. But the actual people, actual number of people who will come out and vote, um, and this is where the uh, where Donald Trump had a bit of an edge uh, over Hillary Clinton. And five key swing states were in his favor. The battleground now is going to be those uh, uh, swing states of Arizona, Michigan, and uh, and, and Florida, for Florida. example. Yep. For example, these are going to be the very very key states where either side, whichever it, it, it sways, they're going to be holding the key to the uh, the White House for come 2021. Now, one area that a lot of people, well, Trump's campaign team has been now arguing for, but the foreign policy to be uh, part of that debate is because, look, the United States dictates global politics, not 
not on paper, but on, in terms of in general, there is a lot of uh, influence that the United States has as, as a global superpower. Definitely. Yep. Sure. And uh, 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 that, to, to avoid that completely out of the uh, equation, and this is one of the reasons why the world tunes in to see who's going to be the next president is because they want to see where the global geopolitics is going to go towards. Um, to have that removed... Uh, from the third debate uh, wants to be the key uh, uh, to have it as a key area of focus is good because we've missed out on the second debate we were meant to have it on the 15th of October uh, sadly because of the COVID-19 situation and uh, and then Donald Trump still persisting persisting that he can go out and campaign even though he was a positive case that was a bit, bit of an issue so with that out the, of out the equation the only and the final debate is this one uh, and it's so important uh, to have a proper debate because last time around we had a debate, it ended up like this. Bickering. You know, you, you pick be surprised. The Go wrong ahead, guy, oh, the wrong oh, night oh. at the wrong time. Listen, did you use the word smart? You graduated <laughs> either the lowest or almost the lowest in your class. Don't ever use the word smart with me. Don't ever use that word. Vote now. You're gonna pack the Make court? sure you, in fact, let people it was, know. It was, it was a sporting competition. Yeah, yeah. It was a sports match. It was a, it was sledging, constant yeah. sledging. Uh, not, no, neither candidate actually had a kind of chance to say uh, what they won. Yeah. But it'll be very interesting to see yeah. the the final, uh, um, the best of three is going to be on the 22nd of now. Yeah, and uh, uh, this is something uh, that we've been following quite a bit. Uh, it's interesting, this rhetoric by Donald Trump as well. He hasn't just uh, savaging Joe Biden. Uh, he's been on a warpath on the campaign trail, attacking a number of figures, including the epidemiology expert, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. He's been calling him a disaster and an idiot uh, and uh, essentially saying that uh, the way or the information that he's provided is rather inaccurate and one that compromises his administration uh, as well. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting here that he's going on the attack here on the campaign trail. It seems to be his uh, strategy as well. Uh, and uh, uh, trying to raise the prospect that uh, his administration has had a more responsible approach to COVID-19 because Fauci himself was overly uh, or was simply critical of uh, the Trump administration's handling of COVID-19, including uh, waiting for two weeks uh, during early March, hoping things would go away on their own. Uh, but uh, definitely this is a major thread that is set to be addressed uh, during the debates, uh, the COVID-19 response. Joe Biden is going to talk about what he would have done, how things should have been done as well, and expect that to be a major point of contention uh, during the upcoming debate on Thursday. It'll be very interesting to see. I'm looking forward to this uh, yeah. I I indeed. And uh, to use uh, um, those remarks of being a school, um, that you're last in class, <laughs> so don't say that you're smart. It's just incredible. I, it will certainly be missing these. Uh, the, uh, the, we really missed that from our... Uh, uh, from our from the second debate uh, to be precise uh, but let's see what happens with the US elections it is going to be the talk of the town as we approach the 3rd of November election date uh, that is when the uh, the votes will be coming in uh, a lot of them will be uh, through postal so the, it might take some time to collect all of the information and, and come up with the the result maybe it might be delayed by a few days might be delayed by a few weeks you never know uh, but we are gearing up for the election season it kicks off uh, on the 3rd of November and then we will get to see and the, the the president will be inaugurated in January 2021 but what from what we remember of Joe Biden as the vice president with Barack Obama was also quite interesting he did have a, a low-key uh, persona but there's a lot of memes of oh Joe oh no Joe uh, uh, between, yeah, 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 between yeah, Obama and Joe Biden so it, it, it's going to be interesting to see if he takes the helm of the White House. Text lines remain open, 4215, if you'd like to have your say uh, on the uh, the president, upcoming presidential debate. Uh, but for the time being, the morning majlis shall take a bit of a break. And uh, up next, we'll talk about uh, the developments here in the Emirate of Sharjah. And then there's another uh, quiz question lined up for you uh, in line with the Sharjah International Book Fair. Stay tuned to Pulse. 95. Join the conversation with the Morning Majlis, Pulse 95. Car lovers out there, the title for the world's fastest production vehicle now has been announced and now belongs to the Tuatara, the latest creation of SSC North America. It's a Bugatti. The boutique American car company announced uh, the record actually yesterday after setting it on October 10th when the car used a claimed 
1,750 horsepower to clock an average speed of 316 miles per hour on a pair of high speed runs. Now, on the quicker of the two, the car hit 331 miles per hour. It reached 300 on the slower run, in fact. Um, and, um, and the production car speed record is what its name suggests. A record set by a street legal production car. A car that you or I could theoretically buy and drive legally, for example, on U.S. roads, provided that you have $1.6 million. <laughs> Yeah. So if you want to have uh, this Tuatara in your driveway, you got to pay in cash in some real money. $1.6 million because that's what uh, the SSC will demand of you. It's it's a pretty <laughs> cool story. It's a car that no one's ever heard of. Yeah. SSC Tuatara hypercar. Uh, it posted an average speed of 316 miles per hour. So that's yeah. uh, 508.7 uh, kilometers per hour. Uh, while driving on an 11-kilometer stretch. So this result beat, by a large margin, the records that were set uh, by Bugatti. Uh, its uh, pre-production Chiron prototype uh, was at 304.77 miles per hour. And uh, what I find so fascinating about the story is the obscurity of the car maker itself. When you uh, look, for instance, into Bugatti, they've got the whole team of engineers, uh, deep production run, deep pockets, but SSC did not have that large supportive automotive gr group. It's got a pretty small production volume in and of itself. So it's almost like a David and Goliath story. And yeah. uh, the underdog just came out on top. Oh. I'm trying to find a video that has got the sound of the engine. And this is at the speed of 233 kilometers an hour. And obviously being filmed from inside. I'm going to be that loud. Oh, now it's touching. 300. Oh. <laughs> wow. It's something. 331 miles per hour is what they hit this SSC to Atara. Um, What's your dream car, guys? To own. Hmm. If you were to own uh, a car, what would it be? And if you had the money for it, obviously. Hmm. Toyota Tercel. Uh, seriously? Have you remembered Toyota Tercels? Really? I'd, I'd do Toyota Tercel up again. I mean, have you? Do you remember Toyota Tercels? No. You don't remember Toyota Tercels? I don't know. They I were have to back see it. in the days. GCC's favorite mobile. Really? <laughs> it was a smaller version of Toyota Corolla. Okay. No one remembers. That's, that's a dream car. <laughs> that's your dream car. Oh, I now I remember it. Okay. Yeah, I have to have a visual uh, uh, memory for it. I'm pretty bad at cars. Don't ask me. I, for me, Mustang was always my favorite. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't want to get a Mustang this time around. I ended up with a green mobile uh, of Dodge Charger. But uh -huh. um, but yeah, I'm very happy with that. That is my um, bay number one at the moment. Yeah. Bay so, number bay one. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> Implying there's a bay number two. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's, so that's what right. we uh, I like about that um, yeah yeah what's yours I'm, I'm looking forward for the Genesis GV80 it's coming up I think uh, in the new line of, uh, line of, lineup of 2021 cars it's gonna be expanding it's uh, like th three, uh, three uh, sedan lineup to include this mid-sized uh, SUV and they're saying that it will compete with the Audi 87 and the BMW X5 and Lexus RX um, but yeah, it, it, it comes with a great price. Um, it looks so lavish. Uh, I feel like it looks kind of like a Bentley. Resembles a Bentley mm. in some way, but mm. it definitely doesn't cost as much as a Bentley. Um, and it's kind of like a hidden gem. Not, not everybody uh, drives a Genesis. I feel, I don't know, when you look in the road, uh, you don't feel like a lot of people drive mm. Genesis. Uh, but yeah, for them to uh, come up with a mid-sized SUV Genesis finally for the first time, so excited for it, and it looks amazing. Uh, yeah. Shout out if you know Toyota Tercel. Oh God, Back we're still talking days. about Toyota yeah. Tercel. <laughs> Built from 1978 until 1999 in this top production. Toyota Tercels were the way. <laughs> very efficient, very easy to man uh, navigate across the narrow streets uh, had a fantastic engine as well what was the first car you drove like you owned owned uh, my first car uh. it's parked outside in the Sharjah Broadcasting no way. Authority that was the, the first moment. one yep it is there. my wonderful Ford Fusion the one that my first very first car that I've owned um, and um, 
Yeah, I remember. And, and back in the days, my dad used to drive a, a Mercury. The first car I had was a, a, a 91 um, a Honda Civic. Oh. And it was a red one. Oh. Yeah. Can you, you believe? You started driving in 91? No, I was, uh, I was 16. <laughs> I was in the States. I lived in the States, so it was legal for us to drive at 16. 91? Yeah. yeah. It was legal for you to drive at the age of two? <laughs> No, it's a 91 that- model. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 91 Toyota okay. Civic. I was like, The wow. model, the model of the car. I okay. was 16. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. No, that was the first car I drove was a 91 was a 91 mm-hmm. Honda Civic. Honda, Honda Civic. Civic, yeah. Okay, cool. I was now, 16, not got, two. We've got that clarified, just in case the U.S. <laughs> consulate uh, was going to be after us and saying, yeah. okay, can we have Rani Saadi report to us <laughs> immediately? Well, one thing is for sure, remembering the days and remembering our yeah. old cars, there's no place like home. If you liked this episode of The Morning Majlis, drop a like and subscribe. 95. Be sure to follow us on Instagram for all our daily updates and top stories. Bubbles.